Hi, and welcome to this edition of Live and Ticking. The topic of today's event is what's causing my chest pain. I'm Fergal McKinney, head of British Heart Foundation, Northern Ireland. Each year in the UK, around 200,000 people are investigated for angina-related chest pain. Chest pain can have a variety of causes, from indigestion to coronary heart disease. And without tests, it's difficult to tell if it's being triggered by something life-threatening or benign. Chest pain should always be taken seriously and checked by a doctor, especially if it's sudden, severe, persistent, or accompanied by other symptoms such as breathlessness, nausea, dizziness, or fainting. Chest pain can indicate conditions such as a heart attack or aortic dissection, which require immediate medical attention. Today, we'll be speaking to one person who knows that all too well, Chris Pye, a keen runner, started experiencing chest pain while running two years before suffering his heart attack. We'll hear the full story from Chris shortly. We'll also be joined by Dr. Peter Swoboda, who's a BHF funded researcher, consultant cardiologist and associate professor in cardiology at the University of Leeds. Peter will be talking about a clinical trial he's leading aimed at trying to improve health outcomes and quality of life for patients with suspected cardiac chest pain. If you have any questions for our speakers today, you can submit them via the Q&A box throughout the talks. We'll also be joined later by senior cardiac nurse Regina Giblin for questions. We will try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A. However, if we're unable to answer your question, then you can call our heart helpline and speak directly to one of our cardiac nurses. You can also join our Health Unlocked community forum for support. This forum provides a safe space to discuss living with any heart or circulatory diseases. All of our incredible research is funded 100% by you, the public. If you're inspired by what you hear today, then all donations to support our life-saving work are very much welcomed and appreciated. There's a link to donate in the chat box, should you wish to do so. We're also delighted to announce that our seventh annual Heart Hero Awards are back for 2024, and we want to hear from you. The awards celebrate the incredible fundraisers, young advocates, lifesavers, healthcare professionals, and outstanding supporters who go above and beyond for British Heart Foundation. So if you know a Heart Hero, then we'd love to hear about them when nominations open from the 1st of March. There's a link in the chat box for more information. And finally, before we hear from our speakers, I would like to ask you a quick poll question. And how would you rate your understanding of chest pain? One for very little, five for a lot. I'll just give you a second to register your vote. Now, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Chris, who's going to share his story of chest pain. Chris will be joined by Yana Theodoro from the BHF Research Engagement Team. Over to you, Chris and Yana. Thanks, Virgil. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, thanks ever so much for uh, inviting me to tell my story. Absolutely. Um, so to start us off, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, your age, where you're from, what you do, hobbies, that sort of thing? Right. Well, I'm a 68-year-old male, but my story, I suppose, going back, starts with... Um, I was uh, a chartered surveyor and I retired at 60 and I uh, was enjoying retirement, doing all the normal things, lots of travel, uh, days out, uh, enjoying going for meals, all sorts of other things. And then um, in April 2022, I had a heart attack, which was quite a shock to both me and everybody who knew me. I was a keen runner and I'd done everything right. I'm not overweight, never have been, never smoked, lead a healthy lifestyle. And really, I couldn't understand it. But it started, I suppose, about two years earlier. I was a keen runner. I ran a couple of half marathons and otherwise did lots of 10Ks, the regular park run, the 5K every um, Saturday. And I don't know, a couple of years earlier, before the heart attack, I'd set off running and I'd had a bit of a, I'd had a, bit of a pain in my chest. Now, it wasn't 
sort of, oh my God, what's that? It was more just like a dull ache. And the thing I didn't think, why I didn't think too much of it was that it lasted about 10 seconds and it would go. So I just assumed it was either the cold air, just running into it, or just a touch of indigestion. I didn't think anything at all until April 2022. And uh, I went for a run and the pain came back again. But this time it seemed worse. So I got myself back home, lay on the settee a while, and then suddenly started to think, this really doesn't feel right. But again, it's not like in the movies. You're not clutching your chest. You're not rolling on the floor in agony. As I say, it was more just a dull ache. And, and I put it more like a nuisance pain. So then I decided I'd better call for an ambulance. And the rest then takes its course. Yeah. And it's so difficult with pain, isn't it? Because everybody exp experiences pain differently. Um, I just wondered, when you, when you started to feel that pain, did it ever cross your mind to see a doctor because obviously two years is quite a long time um did, did that cross your mind it didn't really now I'm old with hindsight which is a wonderful thing it should have done but both my parents lived well one 95 the other 93 so I assumed I would live for, forever I didn't think I would ever have any serious medical uh, problems and so yes knowing what I know now I certainly should have done but Again, if it had been lasting for even, say, 10 minutes or so, mm. then probably I would have done. But I think because it was just sort of, oops, a bit of a pain there. And by the time I'd thought of it, it had gone. But it was a sleeping pain. And when I did have the heart attack, then that was definitely the same pain. So it was, obviously was the start of it. Yeah. And on that day in April, when you, when you called the ambulance, um, what, what happened then? Well, we won't get too controversial here, but waited over four hours despite numerous phone calls. And uh, when they did arrive, they were excellent, uh, but they didn't think I had had a heart attack. They did the ECG monitoring a couple of times, then again in the ambulance, and they still weren't sure. And then they were just about to say, well, no, you haven't had a heart attack, when one of them saw a little something on the ECG monitor, a tiny blip, so they said they'd better take me into uh, the main hospital mm -hmm. to um, to be checked over. And uh, went into the hospital and a cardiologist came to see me and he agreed with the ambulance staff saying that, yes, I think he might have had a small heart attack, but we need to do more tests to see. Yeah. And of course, that ECG only shows sort of a snapshot in time. So, yeah, right. different tests need to be had to make to confirm that you've had a heart attack. Um, and what was it coming to terms with the fact that you'd had a heart attack? Because like you said, you thought your health was perfect. You were, yeah, well, there, was, there, there are so many uh, mixed emotions. You think of all sorts. But if I had to choose one, I'd just say complete disbelief. I mean, I just kept thinking, oh, this is a mistake. I, I did think one of the cardiologists would come in and say, we're really sorry, it is indigestion. You've certainly not had a heart attack. Get yourself home. So yeah. uh, that, that wasn't to be. I was told that I'd lost 25% uh, functionality of my heart. And, of course, at that stage, all sorts of things rushed through your mind. And it told me all sorts, most of which I don't remember, because you're still thinking, oh, my goodness, when can I go home? You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so did it start sinking when you heard that figure, 25%? It did, really. I started to think, oh, my goodness, this is serious. But for the next week, I spent uh, my time in the, um, it's like the general hospital mm -hmm. on the side. And um, I was told that I would be taken to the Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital, which is a specialist for um, cardio problems. Uh, and it took... Um, it was seven days before I was moved there and uh, I got there and I was told, well, we'll push this uh, chemical through your veins and it will show either that uh, we can control any problem with drugs or else um, you may need a stent or and <laughs> very unlikely, but you might even need surgery. 
But of course, the conclusion when I'm there, they suddenly said, well, you know, the unlikely event, well, that's what you need. You're going to have to have a bypass operation. And me and my naivety, never having spent a night in hospital in my life, I just said, oh, well, will I be able to go home tonight? And of course, it was, oh, no, you've got to wait here for the for the operation, yeah. which was another week. Yeah. And that way was one of the worst times because you're waiting. Yeah. You, you, you don't want it to happen. You don't want the operation. But on the other hand, you want it to get old, get over with. Because you know, it's make you, you, you know you've got to have it. You can't just walk out and say, oh, it hasn't happened. So, uh, mm -hmm. so a week later, I uh, had the uh, bypass, the single bypass operation, or so I thought. And then when I was in the uh, recovery room, the cardiologist said, oh, well, we've actually done a triple bypass on you. And I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> or worse. <laughs> To that effect <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, so they obviously got in there and saw that the damage was a lot more than, um, than realized yes yeah, yes yeah, yes that's right um so but even at that stage you might think it's funny how you change you might think oh this is dreadful what's going to happen to me i think i've always had a positive outlook on life and i thought well it's done now the worst is over things yeah. can only better and so mm. after, did five, after five days um all was well and i was allowed out of the hospital and came back home mm. uh, very briefly three weeks later i did develop an infection okay. and I did go back into uh, the main hospital the general hospital and uh, i had an, an infection on the lungs mm. and an erratic heartbeat but okay they were all controlled with uh, strong antibiotics yeah. and just in for four days. And then after that, I've never looked back. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So it wasn't like the smoothest recovery process, but it sounds it was, like you did, you did well after that, that infection. Yeah, it, it wasn't really. Um, but on the other hand, oddly enough, the sister-in-law of somebody that I ran with was actually a ward matron i don't think they call them matrons but ward manager yeah at the main hospital and when i came back gosh she said what on earth are you doing here <laughs> chatting and she says it's fairly common she says don't you worry about it she says it doesn't mean anything it just means you've got an infection but it will all be sorted and it has been so yeah, yeah. brilliant and so when you after getting back home after the the that infection period what was your sort of longer term recovery process like have you have you gotten back into running How, how's uh, that been? well no i haven't <laughs> but, no but this is a massive but that's nothing to do with the heart attack okay that i've been running for nearly 40 years and uh, i was getting a bit bored with it well then i don't know if you remember there was a thing came along called covid and um, mm. long, <laughs> and um, because of that, I obviously stopped running, uh, mm. but went walking every day and uh, started to enjoy that far more. And then as restrictions became easier, I rejoined the people I used to run with, but I didn't really look forward to it like I used to do. Mm. And yeah. also, if, if I was doing a, a race, even if it was only a 5K, I was getting to the stage where I thought, oh my goodness, only two more days and I've got to run 5K. And I thought you shouldn't be like that. So, yeah. but I have been told by the um, consultant and all the cardiologists, there's absolutely nothing to stop me running again. So mm -hmm. I could do, but it is honestly just my choice. Also, I think at uh, 68, 40 years running, I've been extremely lucky not to get any running, running injuries. So I don't want to end up with knees dropping off and all this sort of thing. So so yes. otherwise, though, I live a perfectly normal life. I go back on holidays again. We're off to Istanbul next week and That's Japan good. weeks the month after. So we're just about managing yes. to get out. <laughs> That's brilliant. But my girlfriend is so bored with this story and to think she's got <laughs> listen to it all again <laughs> I don't want to hear it again 
well that sounds brilliant it sounds like you you know you still have that zest for life that you always had and um I was gonna say how how's your life changed since your heart attack but it sounds like it, it hasn't really yeah. I mean it, obviously without getting too deep you do think about these things you realize how you were uh, you are just hanging on to life with a thread really but the one thing I would say and the consultant did tell me uh, because I was very fit to start with and because I hadn't smoked or I wasn't overweight or anything he did say your chances of making a completely full recovery are excellent he says you, you'll have no problems in the future and another guy said look at it that you like a car something was wrong you've been in for repair and now you should have lots of happy motoring in front of you so <laughs> That's that is wonderful and just to to finish it off have, do you have any advice for anybody who might have recently had a heart attack go through something similar what what would your advice to them be uh, oddly enough one of my running friends had a, a heart attack exactly like me in november and is just uh, recovering from a triple bypass so the advice i would give him and anybody else who wants to listen, is that it does seem bad. And when you're told you've had a heart attack, you think, not me, that happens to other people. But it does get better. And rest assured, when you come out of the operation for the bypass, that's the lowest of the low. And slowly but surely, when you get back home, you think, well, I'm over the worst now. And the first time, very quickly, the first time I went out for a walk, oh my goodness, I could hardly put one foot in front of the other. And I thought, I'm going to be an old man just hobbling along. But lo and behold, within a month, I was walking back pretty much to my normal speed. I thought, I can walk again. It's brilliant. So, yeah, thanks to all the research, of course, that BHS do as well. We could give them a quick plug. But yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> life it is amazing how, how resilient the body is, isn't it? And how yes, it is. indeed. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Um, no, thank you for asking me. Yeah, your positivity really, really shines through. So thank you. Um, Fergal, back over to you. Yes, and thank you very much, Chris, indeed. And can I echo Jana's comments that we really appreciate uh, you uh, telling your story and I didn't expect to be doing this but I think I smiled through the whole thing uh, which is sort of a reflection of your inspirational approach uh, to what happened to you and since. So our next speaker is Dr Peter Swoboda who's conducting a clinical trial to understand what is the best approach to investigating chest pain. Welcome Peter. Hi, hi. Uh I'm just going to share my slides if that is okay. Okay, my name's Peter Swoboda. I'm from Leeds. I'm a, a cardiologist and a researcher, and I'm going to talk about what's causing my chest pain and then a little bit about what's the best test for me. First of all, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a background of my career. I won't, you, don't, you don't have to hear my whole life story, but just wanted to highlight two things. Um, so... I started off uh, doing fairly standard medical school and, and clinical training in Yorkshire. And then I did a PhD in 20, between 2012 and 2015, which was funded by a BHF fellowship. And that was really my first steps into research. And that sort of got me interested in research. I then did a, a university academic post and then uh, started working as a consultant cardiologist in 2019. Uh, in 2023, I was appointed as an associate professor. And again, that was funded by the BHF. And so the point I was trying to make is that these two important parts in my career where I've been doing research have been entirely funded by the BHF. So my clinical work is, my, my job's half and half clinical and research. My clinical work is sort of standard cardiology things like the, like the doctors that uh, Chris will have met on his in his admission, I do I do care for inpatients on the coronary care unit and I have a clinic. I also work leading the MRI service in one of the hospitals here in Wakefield. And I do lots of work in training um, future cardiologists. Uh, my research is all about, there's two fronts really. The half of it is doing these large clinical trials, which I'm gonna tell you about today. And the other half, which is also funded by the BHF is really about understanding the risk of 
of heart rhythm problems in athletes and maybe i'll tell you about that another day and and i supervise um phd students and train future academic cardiologists as as part of that part of my career so now now on to chest pain so just to reiterate what fergal said right at the beginning this is from the nhs website fairly standard advice we give to everyone if you get sudden severe pain that doesn't go away particularly if you feel sweaty sick lightheaded call 999 and i think that's simple advice that we should be given to everyone and then the the standard nhs advice is if the pain comes and goes or if if it goes away quickly but you're still worried you still need to see a doctor and probably the advice there is to start by seeing your gp and then what what we'll do then is we'll try and work out whether this is cardiac, i.e. coming from the heart, or non-cardiac chest pain. And, and a lot of that's done by the history, the way the patient tells you their story. And so, for example, if the pain starts after eating or um, you have sensations of bringing up food or bitter tasting fluids or you feel full and bloated, that might be heartburn or indigestion. And there's a, there's a sort of a picture of acid reflux up into the esophagus there. Um, if the pain starts after a chest injury or after prolonged exercise and it's worse when you take a big breath in and it feels a bit better when you rest the chest wall it might be a muscle strain and we call that musculoskeletal chest pain and there's a a picture of the muscles overlying the overlying the overlying the chest cavity um, pain that's sharp continuous triggered by worries or stressful uh, situations the heart often associated with a fast heartbeat sweating and dizziness that might be related to anxiety or panic or, or even depression if the pain's worse when you take a big breath in if you've got a cough or you're coughing up yellow or green mucus or you've got a high temperature that might be a chest infection or even pleurisy so the chest x around the right shows a, a patient with a pneumonia in the on the right side of the chest in medicine we on, on x-rays the right is on the left and the left is on the right so you can see the l in the top right corner saying left hand side um so they've got a right-sided pneumonia and they might even get pain many years after that pneumonia because of scarring on the lining of the lungs and we call that pleurisy um and finally if you've got a tingling feeling on the skin and a rash that blisters that could be shingles and that's an that's an example of a patient of sh with shingles over the left side of their chest. These are non-cardiac chest pains. I'm now going to talk specifically only about cardiac chest pains. And this is this picture is from a BHF campaign. I think it was about 15 or more, 15 years ago, but it still sticks with me about the typical characteristics of chest pain, which which are described. So when we describe chest pain, or when we describe any pain, we talk about the location. And here it might be central in the chest. The radiation, which many of you will know, cardiac chest pain radiates down the arms or into the neck or the back. This is often called a squeezing, char squeezing character, the character of the pain. There are associated features like sweating and nausea. We need to know the duration of the pain. Is this lasting seconds, minutes or hours? Um, precipitance. So is it associated, for example, with exercise like Chris told us? Uh, are the relieving factors does it get better when you stop exercising does it, get, does it get better when you use a gtn spray but this is the one important part one of the important parts of today is that every single patient is different and only a small minority of patients present like the patient from the campaign with the classical angina and in fact we know that we know that different patients present in different ways, for example, older patients or female patients or even patients from certain ethnic minorities might describe their pain in different ways. And it's really important that we're attuned to that and we still carry out tests to investigate pain, even if people do not have the classic description of chest pain. And just to just to reiterate that 999 advice again, if it's prolonged chest pain. So now we're thinking about angina. So Chris had angina for the first couple of times he exercised and then developed a full-blown heart attack. And this is what we're really trying to prevent. What we're trying to do is pick up when patients have angina, identify those who are at high risk, and then intervene to prevent the need for a heart, the, you know, prevent the patient having a heart attack. 
And these these are the nice guidelines here. These are the national guidelines that we follow in this this country, where it shows the patient presents with chest pain. We examine the patient, listen to their history. Um, we then do some initial investigations. I've put a little red box around there because that's the important bit for me, initial investigations. And then we either say, yes, this is angina or no, it's something else. And the NICE guidelines are quite simple. They say that everyone should be having a CT scan of the chest. And I will I'll describe all these tests to you in a moment. So CT scan of the chest. But there are other tests available. There's stress echo, stress echocardiogram. There's a nuclear scan where we put a nuclear tracer in, in, in patient's arm or even a cardiac MRI scan. And I will discuss all of those in a moment. The NICE guideline is good in its simplicity because it says everyone should be getting CT, but it doesn't take into, a fact, into account the fact that everyone is different. Every patient's different. Uh, there might be different factors within each patient that might mean they might do better with an individual test. And I think that's what we're really trying to get to the bottom bottom of in this trial is, is it better for everyone just to have the CT or is it better to try and personalize according to the individual patient needs and preferences? And also the doctor's you know, particular skills or what's available in your area. So I'm going to show you a video now, which we've done with our local uh, inclusivity group here in Yorkshire and, and which will explain the trial that we're doing. Hopefully very simply, we've spent a lot of time trying to really work on this and give it a really clear message. So hopefully it describes it much better than I can. Will someone shout if you can't hear it? Angina is pain or discomfort to your chest that can be caused by narrowing of the heart arteries. This is called coronary heart disease. There are currently several tests available to identify if narrowings are present and if they are present to work out if they need treatment. We do not know which tests are best for patients, which we hope to address in this study. We are asking 4,000 people across the UK to take part. If you consent to take part in the study, you will be randomly assigned to one of two groups. Group 1. This group will get a cardiac test following UK national guidelines. This will usually be a CT coronary angiogram. CT stands for computerised tomography and is a sophisticated type of x-ray. You will lie on a bed inside a scanner and will receive an injection of a contrast dye into a vein in your arm. You may also receive medicine, a beta blocker, to slow your heart rate down a little bit. Group 2. This group will get a test chosen by your doctor according to individual patient risk factors, local availability and expertise. These tests could include Stress echo You are normally asked to walk on a treadmill and then ultrasound pictures of your heart are taken. Some patients may need a cannula to be inserted into a vein in their arm to give a dye that improves the quality of the pictures. Stress MRI You lie in a short tunnel which holds a large magnet. During the scan, you will have an injection of MRI contrast medication. You will also have a medicine, adenosine, to increase the blood flow to your heart. Myocardial perfusion scan. This test is carried out on two separate days. On one day, pictures of the heart will be taken at rest. And on a second day, after injection of a medication, adenosine, to increase the blood flow to your heart. On both days, you will also have an injection of a radioactive dye into the blood which is taken up by the heart muscle. Your heart scan will be reported by a consultant in the normal way at your local hospital. Further treatment will be decided by your own cardiologist. There are no additional hospital visits, but the research team will need access to your medical records. We will only use information that we need and will keep your data safe and secure following strict privacy rules. If you agree to participate in this part of the study, you may be invited to complete three simple health questionnaires when you join the study, after six months and at 12 months. This can be done remotely via mobile phone or email and should take no longer than 20 minutes each time. We know that patients from ethnic minorities are more affected by coronary heart disease. However, they have not been included in previous studies. We are looking to rectify this in this study by specifically trying to encourage patients from ethnic minorities to take part. It is really important that we recruit as many patients from minority backgrounds as possible so the results can be applicable to patients from all communities and ethnicities. Thank you for considering this study. Right, so that, that's the video we show to patients when we're trying to explain to them this trial and hopefully it does a good job of doing it quite simply. 
And so really just to reiterate that, what we're doing in CMARC 3 is we're, we're saying, does personalised care, you know, picking a, the right test for the patient compared to CTCA, does it improve outcomes? And so we measure outcomes as, as the need for an invasive angiogram, which Chris will have had before he had his bypass surgery. Uh, does it reduce the risk of having a heart attack, which is obviously what we're trying to prevent, what this is all about? Or even does it reduce the risk of, of death related to heart to uh, heart disease? That's in all 4,000 patients in the trial. In 1,300 patients, we're also doing this quality of life study where we ask patients about their quality of life at three time points by this simple questionnaire. And our feeling is that personalised care will improve quality of life by helping patients get the diagnosis quicker. It will get them a more accurate diagnosis and therefore improve quality of life. And also, if you get a quicker treatment and therefore less symptoms, it may improve quality of life that way. And so that's that's the first part of that. The second part is we're collecting data on how much it costs to the NHS, which is increasingly important. For example, if you have one test and it's inconclusive and you need a second or even third test, that becomes quite expensive. And if you can answer everything at the first go, then maybe that's better value for the NHS. So that's that's the principle of this, this quality of life study. As we said in the video, we've made this trial really easy for patients. And I think that's really, really important because number one, we're trying to recruit a large number of patients. But number two, we want the trial to be really inclusive and we want everyone from every background to be able to consider to take part. And so consenting to the trial is very easy because we're not doing anything that's outside of normal care. Everything that you would get in this trial is standard care within the NHS. You can consent on your phone by e-consent. You can consent over the telephone. You can consent uh, via standard ink signature on a piece of paper. We have all these ways to make it really easy for patients. The follow-up is by, by review of electronic records. So there's no extra phone calls to patients and no, certainly no extra visits to hospital, which I know is a major, um, a major uh, problem with doing research these days. Um, and finally, the questionnaires are all sent out either electronically or by post. When we first started out the trial, most patients asked for it by post. But now towards the end of this um, quality of life, nearly all the patients prefer it by email. And, and for us, that works really well. And so at the moment, we've recruited nearly 1,800 patients to the trial. So we're nearly halfway there. We've recruited 1,200 patients to this quality of life study. So the quality of life study will actually be finished recruiting in the next um, next month or so. Unfortunately, we can't do the quality of life analysis until we finish the, the whole study. So we won't get the whole, the whole answers about quality of life and cost effectiveness for a couple of years, but we do think it's gonna be very important and informative um, when, when we do get those results. This is the flow chart for the trial. I think we've, we've sort of, We've sort of been through this a, a couple of times now, so I won't I won't go over this again. And I was asked I was asked by um, Yana when I when I was to do this talk to tell to tell you about what's coming next about the next things we're working on, and this is a new trial that's just been funded by NIHR, which is similar to CMARC in that we're trying to work out what the best test is, but rather than patients with chest pain. This is specifically for patients with, with heart failure. So it's sort of a different group of patients, but the same principle of is, is it best to do one specific test for one specific patient or, or should, we, should we consider individual tests for individual patients? And this is, this is hopefully going to be starting in the next um, six to 12 months. So I'll hopefully be able to tell you more about that one day as well. And that's called CrossHF. Okay, so I think that's, that's, that's to draw things to a close. I'm going to finally tell you how the BHF has supported me. So obviously they funded my research when I was doing my PhD and now as an associate professor. And without that funding, I just simply wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm doing now and do all this research. Um, BHF have also awarded specific funding to some of the trials that I'm doing. So CMARC 3 is in part funded by the BHF. And BHF is funding the athletes work that I'm doing about um, reducing risk in athletes. I've got to know the BHF media team, which has been, um, which was, which is a, a new thing that you know, certainly not taught about at medical school. And um, 
my athletes work has been picked up on the local news and I got to do some filming with the BBC about some of the work we're doing there. Um, and again, without the BHF, you just haven't got the access to um, get your get your work out there to people and get it out to the public. Within the, the BHF is an amazing community of researchers. We've got some of the best researchers in the world in cardiovascular disease. And, you know, being a still a relatively young uh, consultant, you know, I've been a consultant for five years. It's a great opportunity for me to find more experienced researchers to work with, to share ideas with, to collaborate with, to learn from. Um, so, so again, BHF has been central to me for that. Finally, last point is that um, I now work with researchers all over the world and um, I'm often told how lucky we are to have the BHF and that many countries, they don't have the same access to research funding that we do. And I think it's something to be incredibly proud of. And also, um, you know, it's really important that we carry on to support it. We all know that the NHS is really facing great pressures at these times and we're all facing great pressures. And it's really, really important, I believe, that we carry on supporting the BHF as best we can to keep doing this these, this research that we, we are doing. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for your kind words about the BHF. And as you say, you know, none of it would happen without the support of the public, um, because all of this research is publicly funded and um, you know, and it's fantastic to hear the, the journey that you're on. Uh, we're going to welcome back now Chris and uh, uh, Senior Cardiac Nurse Regina Giblin. But I'm going to kick off with you, Peter, a question, Justin. Why in that? Uh, I'll tie two questions together, actually, uh, both from an anonymous attendees. Why did you decide to get into this area of research in the first place? And what's the end goal for the research? So the start and the end. Yeah. So how did I get involved in? So often I think in research, it's it's rather opportunistic. You know, you, your opportunities arise and you have to sort of take, take them as they come. And, and actually in Leeds, we've got a track record of doing this sort of research about investigation of chest pain going back over must be 15 years now and the first CMARC trial and the second CMARC trial were both funded by the BHF and so as a junior researcher during my PhD I was around when they were doing that first trial and so when the opportunity came to get involved in this third trial the third CMARC trial I, I was I was very keen to do that and that's that's really how I got involved in this this part of my research um the the second part of the end goal the the end aim is to really impact the guidelines so the way the purpose the way i always say it is as a researcher as a, as a clinician i can only change things for the patient in front of me i can only improve outcomes for that one patient but as a researcher the aim is to change guidelines to change practice so we're actually improving things for all patients throughout the nhs maybe even the world you know to to find the best test for the best patient and then change the guidelines so that's so that's captured for all patients okay a further one for you um and you've touched on on on, on recruiting but this uh, questioner wants to know how do you recruit specifically from minority backgrounds and what's the process to find these patients it's a really it's a really good question and something that that's very important is that um patients from minority backgrounds have increased risk of heart attacks. You know, South Asian patients have increased risk of heart attacks. And yet we know that um, they're underrepresented in trials and therefore the guidelines when it comes to management of these patients is weaker because we have less evidence. So it's absolutely central that we try and make our research as inclusive as possible. And the first thing you need to do is make it easy as possible for patients. You know, barriers barriers to inclusivity are simple things like having your um, having your uh, video. So, for example, that video you've seen there, we've got that translated into seven or eight different languages now. And even if the, the patient probably some of the patients speak good English, but showing that you've made the effort to translate it into their language, I think goes a long way in in convincing people that you know that your motives are good and that we're trying to 
do research to help people. And I think make as a researcher and as a cardiologist, we have to make that effort. And then, and then I think patients are more likely to agree, but it really is a challenge. You know, we're um, traditionally in, in trials of chest pain, many, many people have struggled. Previous trials have struggled to get more than five or 10% of minority patients into their trials. But yet we know that probably in this country, probably 10 or 12% of patients presented to chest pain clinic from minority backgrounds. And so our aim for CMARC is to get up to that 10 or 12%, and I really hope we will. Okay. Um, Regina, um, question for you. How soon after a heart attack can you start exercising again? Hello. Uh, really interesting research, Peter, and thanks for sharing your story, Chris, as well. Um, so the question is, when can you start exercising after a heart attack? I would say it really depends on the person. Um, uh, when I worked in cardiac rehab many years ago in the NHS, we would actually encourage people to start exercising as soon as they got discharged from home. We would say to start walking every day at a pace you were to carry on talking, but a little bit shorter breath because you want to raise your heart rate a little bit. And, and we would say like to do it on the flat and uh, so flat ground. And I would say, you know, it depends what that person was doing before, but if and also depends on much heart muscle damage to happen because of the heart attack. So, um, but to recover the heart exercise does help so i would say five to ten minutes every day the first week second week we do 10 to 15 minutes every day and the third week 15 to 20 and gradually build up until you're doing about 30 minutes walking five times a week at a moderate pace which is when you're a little bit short of breath but able to talk but as i said it's very individual it depends on um the person themselves and they can get this advice from their local cardiac rehab team hopefully um people who've had a heart attack are invited to the local cardiac rehab course to get some uh, structured exercise and education about the heart attack, about recovery, about the medication and about further treatments that they're going to have. But um, with exercise, you know, it is encouraged because it does help the heart muscle to, to get better. And um, the heart is a muscle and we should exercise it in order for it to be more efficient. Okay, one for you and you as well, Peter. Uh, uh, should we consider moving, you, you've touched on this a bit, Peter, but should we consider moving away from the emphasis on the word pain? Uh, Ian McNaughton says he had more discomfort as many others and suspected indigestion. Others are tired. Shall I, shall I start? Um, I think it's chest pain is a good starting point because I think that's still our red flag, you know, when patients are having a heart attack that's the red flag that we look out for but i think it's really important that patients and clinicians and allied health professionals paramedics were all switched on to the fact that everyone presents differently and patients who are having angina may present with very different symptoms and patients who are having a heart attack may present with very different symptoms and i think you know every every time i'm on call we meet patients who have who have uh, written off their heart attack as indigestion and so our advice would be, you know, our threshold for investigation is low. We're always happy to see patients and 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 make an assessment. And I think I think the questioner makes a very good point that everyone presents differently, and it's really important that we 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 are aware of that. Regina, did you want to uh, jump in? Um. I agree with what, what Peter was saying, basically, but um, I think, you know, what, with regards to it kind of ties into his research, it's very individual how people experience chest discomfort or chest pain, chest tightness, chest, chest pressure even. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear there's a low threshold for, for checking people out. It's about listening to, you know, their symptoms of what they're experiencing, but it's also their history, you know, how long they had the pain, where the pain is, you know, was it was there any precipitation? factors all the things that Peter mentioned in his presentation and and also Chris what Chris mentioned about how he experienced a heart attack but um what I would say is like um as I said yeah everyone is different but um it's important that we look at the risk factors as well towards heart disease it's one of the most common causes of, heart, of chest pain is heart disease so you have to kind of rule it out before you you know you think about other 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 reasons for chest pain yeah, this question's resonated with a lot of people actually, and it is down to this: is is can you tell the difference between indigestion and heart attack pain? 
is there, is there something that tells us the difference or is it that you've got to investigate and that's the next level? Um, shall I take this one? <laughs> yes. um, so indigestion type pain can happen um, after someone has a meal. Um, they feel like heartburn, for example. They can get a bad taste in their mouth. You can start to have hiccups that kind of don't stop. Um, but again, sometimes people have digestive symptoms with a heart attack as well because they can get nausea and they can vomit. So it's really hard to decipher. And I think if you're ever worried, the best thing to do is ring 999. Okay, good advice. Uh, Chris, question for you, uh, and there are more, by the way, so I've been holding right. them back. <laughs> are you on any long-term medication? This uh, person wants to know. Fiona, good fellow. Uh, yes, I am. And uh, I did think afterwards when I was asked, uh, had my life changed? And I said, no, it's gone back to as it, as it was. Um, well, that's not quite true, of course, because the big difference is I wasn't on any medication and now I'm on four different medications. One's a beta blocker, one's a statin, and two others beginning with B. <laughs> but basically, one controls the cholesterol, which is odd, really, because I've never had high cholesterol by any means. My cholesterol has always been round about 90 over 65, so on the low side. But it's a matter of course, I was told that you do have to take uh, cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, I'm getting mixed up, blood pressure uh, medicine as well. And likewise, my cholesterol has always been about 3.4. And again, you still have to take the medication. But to be honest, it's really uh, two in the morning, one at um, about five o'clock and one before I go to bed. So it, it's not really that bad. And I don't have any side effects, thankfully. Okay, somebody else wants to know, it must have been so hard waiting for over a week for the surgery and how did you get through that and how were you physically feeling at that time? It, it was and what made it worse, of course, was it was still the after effects of COVID. So I couldn't have any visitors and being in a high caring ward, um, there was no TV or anything like that. But I did manage to get a uh, my iPad smuggled in and so I did manage to uh, keep the, the other thing is, I think you're still in a bit of shock. And surprisingly, you, you are, well, not surprisingly, but you are given drugs. And a lot of those do seem to make you quite sleepy. So a lot of the time, even though I was just lying there in the bed, um, by about eight o'clock, nine o'clock, that was it, out like a light and not really woken until something happened, seven o'clock, you know, breakfast started to be served or something like that. So... It sounds strange waiting for a week, but the week did soon go by and you were just resting and, well, what could you do? I couldn't run away. So. <laughs> and oddly enough, the person who I know, the runner who's just had a heart attack, I did say to him, it's such a tiny part of your life. You've got loads and loads of years before and after. Well, what's a week in bed? Probably do you good without the heart attack, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else wants to know, what was the number one thing that helped you with recovery afterwards? Oh, I think that's a state of mind, isn't it? Uh, you probably gather that I've always had a, an optimistic outlook on life. And uh, I, I love life. I did do before and I still do. So I suppose the only thing really was to keep thinking, well, I'll soon be going out again, soon be enjoying meals, all this sort of thing, and it's not back to normal, uh, just have to get through it. So I think it was always looking to the future. And it's funny you mentioned exercise. When I came home, uh, I live on my own, but I've got lots of friends always popping in, sometimes too many, I must admit, I didn't think, oh, I just leave, wish they'd leave me alone. But I live on my own in a house. So, of course, on day one, I had to walk up the stairs to the bathroom. I had to come into the kitchen, cook meals and everything. And, and so you really notice a difference. To start with, I'd get out of bed in the morning, go into the bathroom, have a shower, then have to come back onto the bed, have a lie down for another 10 minutes before getting dressed. And then after about a week, I didn't need to stop. And so you could see progress all the time. It's surprising. Somebody did say, I think it was Yana, uh, how quickly your body does recover and how amazing it is. So I think it was always just looking to the future. 
which is a long-winded answer, sorry. Yeah. I mean, you've said loved life before, loved life after, but has it changed your life? And that's based on a, another anonymous question. Um, no. Well, the thing is, when I was in hospital, the consultant said, you know, you've, you're doing nothing wrong. And the consultant, by the way, said that his lifestyle was worse than mine. And strictly speaking, he should be in the bed and I should be operating on him. Well, I've decided that would have been a bad idea. But um, has my life changed? No, because he said that and because he said I didn't need to make any changes to my diet, then no, it hasn't really. I am, I suppose, more conscious of uh, seeing red spots on anything you buy, the high, um, high saturates and this sort of thing. Uh, and I do notice, uh, even though it, it, maybe it's subconscious, but I, I do sort of look and think, oh, no, I'm not having that. Look at all the red there. So, but that's the only thing, really. Absolutely, absolutely. Ian McNaughton's come back in saying, thanks for the answer. Uh, lucky his wife, he says, was a nurse, so called 999, and that sort of ended the dispute over indigestion or whatever it was, and nausea, so that was good. Uh, Peter, you'll be delighted to know that there's a significant number of people already asking on this uh, uh, session, how do they take part in your study? Um, so, um, and there's one here of Indian origin and would like to know how do I take part in the study. Maybe so, just re-emphasize that for Daisy. So it's, it's CMARC 3 is done through um, chest pain clinics in the in the UK. So it's, it's mainly for patients who are having chest pain at the moment. So hopefully, well, hopefully none of the people on the call are, are having chest pain and being referred to hospital at the moment. And that's that's how we're, we're picking patients up. But um but there's a, there is going to be some really interesting answers, which I hope will be, as I've, we've explained, will be applicable to everyone. Mm -hmm. But I think it's encouraging to see that even on this kind of platform, people are recognising the value of the research and wanting, wanting uh, to Fantastic. participate. Um, Regina, one for you just popped in. Is angina pain primarily on the chest arm or can the back sometimes be involved? Uh, I would say yes, um, you can get angina pain uh, um, in your back. Um, you can get, so people can feel tightness in their chest and it can radiate to their back or to their arm. Um, they can also get a little bit of short of breath as well. Um, and uh, if you have a diagnosis of angina, then hopefully you'll be on some angina medication that you could take to help relieve those symptoms. But if the medication doesn't work, then you know the advice is to call for help, to call 999. If you don't have it, um, a diagnosis of angina, then you know, be good to pop along to your GP to um, to figure out what the cause of this chest pain is, and they might refer you to the chest pain clinic, and then that's how the whole process would get started with regards to looking to see if you have got coronary heart disease. Um, but yeah, um, people do experience angina and angina in different ways. Um, so yeah, I I believe it, it can cause back pain. Yeah, and somebody else has just jumped in asking, should someone with chest pain? Whoops. Where did it go? So John with chest pain accompanied by arm pain, always be seen by a doctor. I would say yes. What do you think, Peter? <laughs> I would uh, I would I would yes, I, I I agree. I think safety first is the principle here. You know, we're doing these tests to rule 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 things out and we don't mind, you know, in, in C Mark and other trials, probably um at the end of the tests, probably 40% of patients have a diagnosis of coronary heart disease. That means 60% haven't, but that's fine. We don't want to, if we were doing the tests and 100% were having coronary heart disease, that means we're missing an awful lot of people and we wouldn't be happy with that at all. So I think having some negative tests is fine. I think that's the purpose of what we're trying to do here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sean has just texted in, Peter. Um, I've just been referred to Mid-Yorks with an episode of chest recently and requires stress echo. Can I ask to join the study? So can I ask you, Sean, to put your email address into our... No, I will go about that just so you keep his data uh, private. Maybe can he email it to the BHF and we'll uh, I'll put him in touch yeah, with my yeah. research or nurses? Ring, our heart help, uh, ring the heart helpline or go on to our... With that, Regina, what would be the best advice? Yeah, I think um, if he goes onto the website for the heart helpline, he can send an email and... Um, 
and explain uh, that he would like to join the research and then we can link, maybe you can, can send the information that, that way. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And, and thank you, Sean. Um, Ian McNaughton's back for a year or two before my MI pains like a needle through my back. I suspect this may have been a sign. And is that recognised? I think that's just proof that everyone's different, isn't it? And that yeah, everyone's, isn't it? Per everyone's perception of pain is different. And I'm sure, you know, for the rest of my career, I'm, I'll still keep hear hearing people experiencing angina in completely different ways. And I think that's part of the part of what we're trying to do here is, is um, you know, encourage people that if you even if it's even if it's a different form of chest pain, it still needs to be investigated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now I may I, I'm asking this question directly off the thing, and if you've covered it already, Peter, apologies. But do any hospitals undertake CTCA for all? As despite guidelines, it would appear the cardiologists continue currently to choose the right test for the individual, as there are limitations with just CTCA. Yeah, I think I think I think that's probably true. Is that most hospitals do not directly follow the guidelines and do CT for everyone? Because, or partly because we probably don't have capacity in the UK to do CT for everyone. And so we, we end up having to do different tests. But the purpose of the, the, purpose of the trial is to show that hopefully that um, personalising care is better than a one-size-fits-all uh, you know, one type approach. And, and that's really what we're trying to, what we're trying to show. Yeah. Andrew Howes here kind of under, underscores the... Uh, just all that we're talking about. When I was 54, I woke up to severe indigestion. After a short time, my wife called 999. It turned out I was in the middle of a major heart attack before leaving home. I had three cardiac arrests. He's now 60. Um, we're running out of time. Um, uh, people are talking, uh, uh, Chris, about an incredible story. Um, uh, somebody else is saying, I love that you say your life hasn't changed since your heart attack. Enjoy your upcoming travels and uh, uh, there was one more any tips that's what it is any tips for spending time in hospital and recovering Chris as one of them is, a, is your is your tablet <laughs> not the medical <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. yeah not really I mean you've just got to make the best of it um, I mean, the vast majority of the staff in the hospital, both hospitals I went to, were fantastic. And uh, also the patients. I was perhaps lucky in that I was in a ward with uh, just five other people and we all got on well and we're all in the same boat. So it's surprising. And I think having never spent any time in a hospital before, well, other than when I was a surveyor and I valued things, but that's another story, um, it was funny that out of the time, there's always something happening, you know, even if it's only the, the person coming round with the tea, the hot drinks or something, then sort of there'll be a doctor coming round, going to another patient. So time does go by. Um, otherwise, yeah, the iPad, lots of Sudoku, um, lots of Wordle, catch up on old Wordles, Word games, this sort of thing. You, you know, time does go by and then before you know it, it's lunchtime and what's a week, as I say, it's nothing. Yeah, yeah. Of course, sometimes wordle can cause pain too, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be the word, pain. <laughs> <That's> right, exactly. <laughs> well, I listen, we're, 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 we're... Heart as my, I often use heart as my first word now. Oh, very good. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. I do it every day. Um, uh, Listen, thank you all very much uh, for participating. Thank you at home for watching this edition of Live and Ticking. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from all of our brilliant speakers. Before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you a final poll question. And how now would you rate your understanding of chest pain? One being very little and five a lot. And if we haven't managed to answer your question today, then we encourage you to visit our Heart Helpline where you can contact our dedicated clinical team about your query. As we've said, this is all made possible by you from your generous contributions and support. If you'd like to make a donation towards our life-saving research, there's a link in the chat box to do so. Live and Ticking is a monthly webinar series and we strive to produce the best events for you, our audience. 
Your feedback and comments are crucial to help plan and develop future events. So we ask if you can complete the survey at the end of this event or through an email you'll receive in the coming days. This live and ticking event was recorded and will be available on your YouTube channel from next week. Our next event will take place on the 27th of March. This will be a special edition of Live and Ticking in collaboration with Diabetes UK on the topic, how does diabetes affect the heart? Make sure not to miss it. Register now using the link in the chat box. Thanks again for joining us and goodbye.